uh, the Memorial Day rush here. If you would please take a look at your uh, worship cards, let me highlight a couple of things. Of course, our Dwell Bible Audio app is an incredible resource. If you haven't been using it, let me encourage you to do so. Uh, we're going to emphasize this in a new and specific way starting next week. Starting next Sunday and for the 12 uh, following Sundays, we'll be studying uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And that will be our summer study. So all of June, July, and August, and just a little bit of September, we'll be studying Ephesians. A couple of resources available for you to help get you ready to dive into Paul's letter there to the church in Ephesus. First, go to the Dwell Bible Audio Listening app. Michelle has done a great job of cultivating playlists. So you can click on our church's tab and see which passages we're going to be in and when we're going to be in them, and you can listen to them in the translation and uh, reader of your choice. So seize that opportunity. Also, uh, up here on the table this morning, you'll see that we have ordered some of these great little Crossway uh, scripture journals. Uh, I think they call them, well, I can't remember exactly what they call them, but a gift for you from Rocky Mount Bible Church. They are free. You don't need to pay us for them. But you'll see on one side of the page... Let me turn a couple pages in here, is the text of Scripture, and the other side is blank. This is a, uh, a great resource. We have a, a few people around here who absolutely love these things. Um, I don't see Josh Lucas this morning, but this is one of Josh's favorite things. We'll have to make sure we get Josh at least one of these. Uh, but he takes all of his sermon notes using one of these little Scripture journals. They are available up here. Please take one before you leave today. It's a, an incredible risk. And again, when we have visitors visit, instead of handing them a full Bible during our Ephesians series will hand them one of these. Just another resource to get you ready for that study. The Baby Bottles of Blessings went out on Mother's Day. They're due back on Father's Day, which is June the 20th. Again, you can fill that with change, cash, check, whatever it is that you want to put in. They will make use of it. And I've already seen a couple of those returned. I think it was the Rob kids had so much change in their house, they filled it up and grabbed another one. So that's pretty exciting. All right. Um, and uh, just want to make sure that uh, if uh, you are not getting the weekly emails, you need to let Michelle know so that you can get on that list as soon as possible. There is an awful lot happening within our congregation about which you need to be made aware. Uh, sometimes that's activities. In this current season, it's prayer requests. So um, if you have not been made aware, there's just an awful lot going on with the people in our congregation. The Emons are moving this morning. Uh, they may have already left Rocky Mount. Uh, I don't, John, do you know for sure? They will officially hit the road tomorrow. They will officially hit the road tomorrow. So I um, want to be uh, praying for them. They are literally moving uh, transcontinentally. So uh, whatever we can do to support them, encourage them, bless them, we want to be able to do that. Uh, we're praying for many with health maladies, not least of which is Pat Milligan, who is recuperating this morning in the VA hospital in Durham uh, and had a uh, brain tumor removed this week and is recuperating well, but there will be a long road ahead of some chemo and radiation and other things. So to stay up to date with what's going on here at the church so that you can be most proactively involved in caring for each other and in praying for each other and encouraging each other, the email is the way to do that. And when there are special things that pop up from time to time, we'll send out something in addition to the regular Tuesday email. So this week, I know you got a couple of those about Pat. Just keep an eye on that. We'll put it on Facebook. We'll use whatever means we can, but, but just be aware that that's how we've been communicating primarily. Um, there are other things going on, but I think it's prudent for us to stop now and turn to Psalm chapter 66. This is... The passage from whence our call to worship comes this morning. Psalm 66, and we'll start in verse 16. Hear this, the word of the Lord. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth. And high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer, 
or removed his steadfast love from me. Father, we pray this morning to praise you. We praise you for the freedom that we have to worship, and we thank you for those that you have sent and our country's long history to make that possible. I pray that we wouldn't take it for granted, and I pray that we would put most of this gratitude together from our hearts and minds into our words and in the way that we regard the Bible this morning. Father, we acknowledge that you have called us out as your chosen people here on the earth. Help us to have not only a deep-seated gratitude there, but to embrace the work that is exclusively that of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, good morning. good morning. We have two brand new books of the Bible to learn today. Well, they're not brand new books, but they're, <laughs> we're going to see some brand new pictures. So, okay. All right. So, first we have General Joshua for the book of Joshua. And the theme of the book of Joshua is that he conquers. And uh, my microphone is making things interesting for us today. So, we'll just m deal with it. All right, so in the book of Joshua, you have 12 chapters that are all about the conquest, that are about the military campaigns, and then you have 12 chapters talking about how they divide up the land. And so it goes from an exciting story to a history of real estate transactions. And, uh, you know, uh, I know when I was your age and I was reading that book, it was like, whoa, what a transition. But you see, that's very the whole point of the conquest, sorry for those of you listening to three of my words on the live stream, <laughs> it's that um, the, the conquest was so they could come into the land. And so it's important that they got the record straight of who got which piece of the land. And the lesson that we can take from that is that victory comes through faith in God and obedience Okay, uh, if we could have the next book up here, we have, well, who can tell me what we have on the screen there? Yes. Judges. Yes, we have some judges on their way to court. And what are they taking on their way to court here? Yes, look. Motorcycles. That's right. So the theme of the book of Judges is cycles. And if you look closely at those cycles, you'll see a number. Yes, look. That's right, because there are seven of these cycles in the book of Judges. Now you're asking me, what is the cycle? Well, they got into the land, and there is this repetition of a pattern. They start with sin. Then God sends some other countries to conquer them, and they go into what is called servitude. And then they pray... And that is, uh, the fancy S word for that is supplication. And then God sends a deliverer, and so they have salvation. And then there is a period of silence as the land rests, as the people rest. 
and enjoy the blessings of being delivered. And then it all starts over again. And so the theme of the book of Judges is that every man did what was right in his own eyes. And you see this cycle happen over and over and over again until the people learn to live in obedience to God's law. All right, we have a new big picture question today. That is, what is our mission as Christians? And the answer is this. We'll just, if you could have the next slide there. Our mission is to make disciples of all nations by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and in our new memory verse, this is a very familiar verse people. Some of the adults may know this in a different Bible translation than the ESV, okay? So we're just going to say what's on the screen. If you hear a slightly different version in the congregation, that's okay. Still God's word, okay? All right, let's say it together. Reference then the verse. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Great. We'll talk more about that verse maybe next time. But now we'll have... King Herod Agrippa was persecuting believers in the church. He killed James, one of Jesus' disciples. When the king saw how happy this made the Jews, he arrested Peter too. The king put Peter in prison and assigned groups of soldiers to keep guard. While Peter was in prison, other believers in the church prayed and asked God to help him. The king planned for Peter to be killed. The night before his execution, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. He was tied up with chains, and other soldiers stood guard at the gate of the prison. All of a sudden, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a bright light shone in Peter's prison cell. The angel struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, the angel said. The chains fell off of Peter's wrists. The angel told Peter to get dressed, so Peter put on his sandals and his cloak. Then he followed the angel. Peter wasn't sure what was happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. The angel led Peter out of the prison, past the guards, through the gate, and onto the streets. Then the angel left. When Peter looked around, he realized the Lord had rescued him from prison <laughs> and from certain death. Peter hurried to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark. Believers had gathered there to pray. When Peter knocked at the door, a servant named Rhoda answered. She heard Peter's voice and she was so happy. She rushed back inside. Peter is here. He is at the door, she announced. But the others didn't believe her. You're crazy, they said. But Peter kept knocking and when they opened the door, they could hardly believe it. Peter motioned to them to be quiet and he told them how the Lord had rescued him from prison. Tell James and the other brothers about this, Peter said. Then he left. When the sun came up, the soldiers at the prison couldn't figure out what happened to Peter, and the king punished the soldiers because Peter had escaped. God answered the people's prayers for Peter. God had a plan for Peter and the church, and he rescued Peter from his enemies. Peter knew he would face death because he believed in Jesus, but he kept going so he could share the good news of the gospel. Following Jesus actually always means having courage. And Peter certainly did, and the Bible tells about many other believers in Jesus who risked their lives just like he did. Now, we live in a place where you may never have to risk your life in your entire lifetime to follow Jesus. But even if you never do, it doesn't mean that life will be easy for you. Because obeying Jesus means sometimes 
choosing things that are unpopular. The world we live in does not love God. The world we live in doesn't obey God and thinks that following him is crazy sometimes. So we can learn a lot by remembering Peter and remembering his courage in suffering. Another thing we can learn from this story is that God's people, when they pray, it means something. Prayer is very, very powerful. And when we pray, God hears us. And we can trust he is good and he's going to act according to his will. In the case of Peter's life and the life of the Christians there in Jerusalem in that time, God worked a miracle so that Peter could be released from prison and could continue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, God is completely miracles whenever he wants. And even if you never see a miracle in result of your prayer, God hears you just the same. So the lesson and uh, point of this story that you can remember is that God rescued Peter from prison. Well, our first morning is a prayer, and I'd like to encourage you to think about it this way as we sing. Where else can we turn but to prayer when our friends move across the country, or when the doctor delivers crushing news? We pray. We plead for God to speak through us and speak to us through his word. We cling to truth. We allow him to shape and fashion us in his likeness. Why do we do this? We do this to allow him to, sh to show the light of Christ and that that light might be seen through us today. So let's, pray. let's, uh, let's sing this morning.
remain standing, our next song, Sing to the King. So even with heavy hearts, we have reason to sing praises to our King. This song reminds us that Jesus fulfilled the law in sinless perfection. He gives us His righteousness. He gives us His life. He gives us His joy. So let's sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been in a brief series that uh, we've entitled Bible Bungle. We've talked about all the different passages that so often get butchered, beat up, torn apart, twisted, and are left there flapping in the wind as people incorrectly interpret the Word of God. I want to address one question this morning, which is fundamentally this. What is God's relationship to Israel now in the age of the church? So many of the passages that we looked at over the last few weeks were passages in the Old Testament. And if you're only flying at this from a bird's eye view, you might think then that, well, the Old Testament is for the Jewish people. And the New Testament is for the church. And so the church can unhitch itself from the Old Testament and not worry about all of those old Jewish promises at all and not worry about what happens to the nation of Israel. And, and all of those passages have been misinterpreted simply because they don't relate to us at all. Well, we know that this isn't true, right? That the God of the Old Testament is the same God in the New Testament. And that while much has changed, God still has a plan for the nation of Israel. And I want to make this argument briefly this morning from Romans chapter 11. You remember way back in Deuteronomy chapter 7, 
as the people are on the precipice of entering into the Holy Land, God says, you are my chosen people. I have chosen you from all the peoples here on the earth, not because you were more numerous than all the other peoples, and not because you were holier than all the other peoples. In fact, not because really of anything that you've done at all, but because way back when I made a promise to your forefather, Abraham, and I intend on keeping that promise regardless of how big or small, how holy or unrighteous you might be. It's not grounded in you, it's grounded in me, in my character. This is the promise in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Now, occasionally the people strayed away from obedience to the Lord. The story of the nation of Israel is the story of a people who went out and came back, who were disciplined, and after their discipline were drawn back into covenantal right relationship with the Lord. Sometimes this discipline lasted a couple of weeks. Sometimes, like during the Exodus, after the people finally got out of slavery in Egypt, and then they got into the precipice right there on the verge of the Holy Land that God had promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and they complained about it and wanted to go back to Egypt. Well, sometimes it lasts 40 years. And sometimes, like after all of the terrible seedy kings of Israel and Judah, sometimes it lasts for far longer. So now we're in a place here, as we get ready to look at Romans chapter 11, where we think this has been the age of the church, and it has been for nearly 2,000 years. Has God abandoned his people? And we say definitively that he has not that while the scope of who counts as God's people, as the sons of Abraham has grown exponentially, God has not abandoned Israel because discipline is an abandonment. Now, Romans is a fascinating book. It's probably, in the eyes of many scholars, Paul's magnum opus. It's the book in which he talks about the doctrine of salvation. This is, I think, the most complicated argument that he makes in all of his letters. It is some of the most beautiful prose, some of the most profound language. It is the apex of all the things that Paul writes. And here in the middle of this great argument about God's relationship to his work in salvation through the person and ministry of Jesus Christ, he stops for three chapters to address specifically, has God abandoned Israel? And it's complicated. When Laura and I were students at Dallas Seminary, uh, the first few months there, I was looking for a church. I think this is what every seminary student who goes to a big seminary out of town does. You've got to go find a place to worship. And uh, I had a professor, and he said, look, there's a church uh, not that far from the seminary. It's a Presbyterian church. They're not dispensational. They're covenantal. But my goodness, that guy is a great preacher. It'd be worth just for your own experience and your education to go over there and check it out. And so I did. And I showed up and he was preaching through the book of Romans. It had been for years. And he was a master communicator and an outstanding exegete. Talk about really doing the work. You could tell this dude was working at a mastery level uh, grasp of the text and, and as a communicator. So I'm there for a couple of weeks and he's at the end of Romans chapter 8. And now the question comes, because there's great contention about how do we understand the relationship between the church and Israel and God's relationship to Israel now and in the future. Now, this is going to start in Romans chapter 9. And so I show up the next week when Romans chapter 9 would start. And he addresses the entire congregation, the worship singing portion of the service is over, and the entire mass there, 1,500, 2,000 strong, gets out their Bibles. And he says, congregation, now the word of the Lord, open to Romans chapter 12. Today we'll be looking at verses 1 and 2. He skipped 9, 10, and 11. And then the congregation, so bewildered by this, uh, requested an email, which was sent out that week. Oh, by the way, this is really controversial, so we're not going to talk about it at all. Well, it's Memorial Day weekend. We've got like half our people here, so we're going to talk about it this morning, all right? (laughs) And... uh, You can send all the emails you like this week, and I'll send it out, and we'll try to handle it. It's one of those giant conversations. Somebody asks you, hey, uh, could you just explain to me in just, say, five or ten minutes, um, you know, salvation? 
and its history traced from, say, Abraham through Revelation? Or could you just explain to me in two or three minutes the kingdom of God? Or could you just explain to me just for a moment Trinitarianism? Just, just encapsulate it for me, just like the 30-second version, right? These are really big questions that have very short answers and very long answers. We're going to try to do the 30-minute version this morning. We start in chapter 11 of Romans chapter 1. Excuse me, Romans chapter 11, verse 1. I ask then, has God rejected his people? This is the nation of Israel. Back in chapter 9, starting the very first few verses, Paul talks about his countrymen. These are the Jewish people. And he so laments the state of their discipline for having rejected Jesus as the Messiah that he says, I know their fate of many of them. I would gladly trade my eternal destiny for theirs. That's how serious he takes it. And then he asks them, the question that everyone is thinking, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and they have demolished your altars and I alone am left and they seek my life. Now you remember the, the ministry of the prophet Elijah, how he does these great supernatural works, these miracles to prove the power and presence of the one true God, the God of Israel. And you might be thinking specifically of that moment when he takes on the 700 prophets of Baal and he tries to get them to appeal to their false God that their offering might be consumed in fire. And then on his altar, now watered down profusely, fire from heaven comes and consumes the entire thing. It's this great triumphant moment in Elijah's ministry and in the history of the nation of Israel. But Elijah doesn't have a lot of backers. Elijah's not popular. In fact, he says, there were other prophets, the Israelites killed them. There were other people crying out that you should follow the one true God, their voices were silenced in martyrdom, right? Now surely, as Elijah cries out, there is only me, Lord. There is but me. I'm the only one left, the only one faithful, the only one honest, the only one worshipful. I'm the only one that remains. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. Paul and any other of the great Jewish apostles could have cried out to the Lord and said, there's only a few of us left. Surely the nation has faltered. It's time to leave them all behind. And just as in the days of Elijah, the Lord said, no, 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 no. I have kept for myself a remnant, thousands upon thousands, secured not because of their merits, but because of my grace. So it is today in Paul's day. There were many of the Jewish people who followed Jesus Christ as the Messiah, who accepted him as the Messianic king. You remember just last week, I think we would have, uh, according to the liturgical calendar, celebrated Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, there were Jews and Gentiles, people of many languages, who were gathered together there in the city of Jerusalem, who are swept up in the fire of the Holy Spirit for the worship of the one true God. Of course, there was a large remnant and a growing remnant as Paul went from congregation to congregation, synagogue to synagogue in the ancient world both in Asia Minor, which is Turkey, and in Greece, and in the far-flung corners of the Roman expanse, and preached to Jews who converted to following Jesus as the Messiah, who accepted him as the Messianic king. Chosen by grace, verse 6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see, and bend their backs forever. 
well, what's going on there? I, I thought you told me that there was a chosen remnant. Well, there was. Now we learn that there are really two different Israels. There is a faithful remnant, those who accepted Jesus as the Messiah, and then there was a large and great number represented by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and many of the scribes who rejected Jesus as the Messiah. The arrival of Jesus Christ softened the hearts of many to accept the truth that they could not save themselves and that they were entirely dependent on his grace, his blood, his death, his resurrection. And yet there were many others who said, no, no, I, I reject this grace. I reject the Messiah. I reject the gift of Calvary, and I'll work for it myself. I much prefer Moses and his law to Jesus and his grace. When Lauren and I got married, we had a 2001 Volkswagen Jetta that was kept fairly tidy until a year and a half after we were married, we had a baby girl who is now unnamed, but the tallest of all of my kids, right? <laughs> and she liked having things to play with in the back seat of the car. And um, I thought, you know, this is going to be bad here in Texas. It'll be much, much better when we move all the way north to North Carolina. Still pretty hot here. Not today, obviously, but many, many days. And I remember we took one trip to Raleigh to see my in-laws, and there were two toys in the back seat, all right? There were crayons, and there were Play-Doh. And both of these got played with. And it was, uh, and I can't remember the exact temperature that day, but something like 150 degrees. And she's in the back seat of the car, and we got there, and a 45-minute trip took something like six hours, I don't know. And a uh, little uh, three-year-old Annabelle along with us got to my in-law's house and, um, hey, we should probably grab those things out of the back seat. No, that's it. I'm going inside. It's taking too long. I'm okay. And we come back out, and the North Carolina sun has been baking there in the back seat. And you know what happened to all the crayons? <laughs> Goo. I mean, a semi-viscous glob of, and uh, actually had to take a, a putty knife and scrape it, just the goo out of the back seat when we got home, Right? You know what happened to the Play-Doh? All the little figurines that had been made, the little animals and the snakes that had been rolled and all that, hard as a brick. You cannot have this Play-Doh back. We talk about this a lot. If it doesn't go back in the little yellow can with cap on top, it's done forever. The same sun that melted the crayons hardened all of the Play-Doh there in the back seat. Same experience. The same Jesus Christ who softened the hearts of those who would embrace his grace and be a part of the faithful remnant was the same son that hardened the hearts of so many of their Jewish brothers and sisters who would not abandon the virtues of their own merits under the Mosaic law, who wanted to earn it for themselves and believed with all their hearts that they could. Well, that's complicated, isn't it? I wish Paul would give us a, a metaphor to help us understand exactly what's going on here. Simplify it for me, Paul. Talk to me like I'm a little denser than you're giving me credit for. And he does. Starting at verse 11. He's going to give us an agrarian metaphor. This is really, really helpful. So I ask, did they, this is my Jewish brothers and sisters, the ones who rejected Jesus as the Messiah, did they stumble in order that they might fall? Right? Right? They've tripped, they're stumbling, are they going to fall down entirely? Are they done? Is this? No, 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 they didn't stumble so that they might fall. By no means, it's the second time he said that. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Fascinating, right? Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I'm speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order to somehow make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. But if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead. If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, then so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a, a wild olive shoot, not 
refined and cultivated in this olive uh, garden here. Now, if some of you wild olive shoots were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, don't be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it's not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. And that is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Now then, the kindness and the severity of God, severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is in nature a wild olive tree and grafted in contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? All right. Now, that's pretty agrarian, but you understand the sense of what's happening here. The nation of Israel is figured as a, an olive tree right? Olive trees were pretty common. They're even represented in some of the decoration and architecture of the Temple of Solomon. Olives were a staple in the ancient Near Eastern world, including in Israel. So this is a really common metaphor. It's an olive tree. In North Carolina, maybe it would have been a pine tree, and we've been talking about pine cones and pine needles. But here we're talking about olive trees. And we're talking about an olive tree that's received the care of the Lord for a long, long time. It's not wild, it's cultivated. The Lord has been tending to his garden full of olive trees here for thousands of years. The promise made to Abraham came nearly two millennia earlier, right? He drew them out of Egypt 1,500 years before this. It's not one that's been just out there left to its own devices. There has been a master gardener who's been taking care of it day after day and year after year for a very long time. But there are some wicked branches, some branches that aren't producing fruit, some branches that are actually hurting the tree. And so the master gardener has come in and has cut them out. In this very Jewish tree, there have been some very Jewish Jews who have become sick. They've rejected the Messiah, and so they've been cut out. Now, I'm not a horticulturalist. I have the incredible knack for killing plastic plants. But there's something fascinating that Paul says happens here. He says, now look, there was this very beautiful, well-cultivated tree that had been tended to very carefully and cautiously for many, many years. But over here, out in the woods, we found a wild olive tree. It hadn't been pruned. It hadn't been cared for. This thing was a mess. But oh my, what wonderful potential for fruit there was. And so some shoots were cut off of that wild olive tree and were brought back to this cultivated olive tree and were grafted in. I've never done one of these grafting things, right? I spent a little bit of time this week on YouTube watching uh, farmers, even today, who are able to do this to olive trees in the uh, ancient, or now not ancient, the uh, Near Eastern world, right? In Israel and Jordan. It's an incredible thing that they're able to do. This is a picture of the way that the Gentiles are grafted in. Paul says that he's an apostle to the Gentiles. So many of his Jewish brothers and sisters rejected the Messiah, but the Gentiles were elated. Gentiles from Pentecost, Gentiles on every one of his missionary journeys, Gentiles in every city who had the good news of Jesus Christ and came to follow this ancient Jewish religion now modified by the arrival of the Messianic King. That there is not only God who is God alone, but God the Father, God the Son, and even God the Holy Spirit, a three in one. They have been grafted in, right? Um, why? Why have they been grafted in? Why would God, the master gardener, go out and find these wild branches and cut them into this tree that he's been working on, this cultivating thing for so long? Well, he gives us a couple of reasons. The first is to make the Jews jealous. 
they're going to receive these wild shoots grafted into this Jewish tree. The possibility for fruit that wouldn't have occurred out there in the wild, it's reserved exclusively for these cultivated ones by the hand and providence of God. And those who have been cut out, these shoots now laid to the side, drying, alone, malnourished, they're going to see what they're missing. Now, it's not that they've been cut off forever. It's not that this was inaccessible to them. They had the option of having it by faith. You might remember the story of the prodigal son. Do you remember? There are actually two sons in that story. Almost every parable that's shared in the New Testament has a point that is to be made about every main character in that parable. Now, you can over-assess any of the parables and ascribe meaning to lots of little bits and pieces, but I'm of the belief that for every major character that there is in a parable, there's probably a point to be made. There's a point about the young prodigal son himself, right? Who is almost assuredly a reference to those of the Gentiles who come to faith and are now brought back into the home. Uh, Dirty, malnourished, hungry, undeserving they feel of the love of the father, they come in humility, right? Don't bring me back as a son, bring me back as a servant. And that kind of humility was indicative in the ancient Gentile church who was drawn into the faith. And then there's a message there about the father, the father of this magnanimous love who runs out to greet the son. But do you remember the other son? There's one more main figure in that, in that story. It's the older son. Now, the older son's been at home the whole time. The older son has had access to all that the father has. The older son uh, works over the fields and the vineyards. He works over all of the animals and livestock. He lives in the father's home. There is nothing that belongs to the father that's been denied to the older son. But as soon as it's extended to the younger son, when the father says, yes, younger son, come in, and he puts a cloak around him, and he says, kill the fatted calf, we're going to have a great grand party, and he puts his ring on him. What's the reaction of the older son? Do you remember? He's jealous. He's jealous. Why would you give all of that to him? And the response of the father is telling. Why are you mad that I'm giving it to him? All of this and your relationship with me is already yours. It's not that the Jewish people have been abused by an uncaring father. All of these were available to them. Jesus himself comes as a Jew, two Jews, performing Jewish miracles at Jewish events and ceremonies, preaching and teaching to Jews in Jewish synagogues. He came to them first. It was their choice. They rejected him. And now those wild shoots have been grafted into the tree to make them jealous. This is the great prayer of Paul, that this jealousy would work. The second reason why they've been grafted in is because, well, for the expanse of God's work in the Gentile world. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, verse 12, right? Verse 14, in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them, For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, this is part of God's plan all along, to enrich the world, to reconcile the world, to draw not just the Jewish people, but to use the Jewish people as a light to reach all of the nations. This morning we talked about the responsibility that we have as followers of Jesus Christ in the Great Commission to go and teach and take the good news of Jesus Christ to the entirety of the world, right? So it was that Israel was to function in the same way. Let your light, Israel, shine forth from Jerusalem that the righteousness of the Lord might draw the nations in. So it was to enrich the world. Thirdly, it was to glorify God for bringing his mercy back. There was the possibility here, it says in verse 22, now the kindness and the severity of the Lord, severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you. Verse 23, and even if they who do not continue in their unbelief will be grafted in, for God has the power to bring them in again. These unbelieving Jews have been cut out. Are they then out forever? I think Paul would say, by no means. 
By no means. The mercy of God will be magnified in drawing a massive number of the Jewish people out of unbelief and into the embrace of Jesus Christ as the Messiah as they are then grafted back into the tree that was originally theirs. And he makes this really clear in the verses that follow, verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I don't want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel forever. Right? Well, no. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. In the great promised plan of God, there is apparently a moment in history in which the gospel will have so permeated the Gentile world that God will then return his attention with intensity to the Jewish people. Verse 26, and in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. And this is a citation, I think, from uh, Isaiah 57, 59. And in this way, it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Were there some of the Jewish people who were sinful? Of course. Some of the Jewish people who rejected the Messiah? Of course. Some of the Jewish people who had to be cut out, even though they had been cultivated for so, so long, had to be cut out of their own tree for the rejection of Jesus? Of course. But their sins wouldn't define them forever. The Lord was going to pursue them. The Lord was coming after them. The Lord was going to take away their sin. And as we see in the new covenant, give them a new law written on their hearts. And they would become the teachers of the world. Now, I've heard some say, and this is an argument that sometimes you'll hear in covenant theology. Well... You know, if you take a look at the way that the Jews are talked about there in Romans 9, 10, and 11, it's always talked about in the past tense. And in fact, uh, every verb that refers to the Jewish people here in Romans 9 through 11, they're all past tense verbs, right? Uh, Paul is simply talking about a deal that was exercised with the Jewish people there in the first century or before. But that's not true. That's not true at all. Take a look at verse 26. And in this way, all Israel, future passive indicative, all Israel will be saved. Now, I think the Lord has disciplined the Jewish people. It is no surprise to me that for the rejection of the Messiah in AD 33, that the Roman Empire was used like many ancient evil empires were used throughout history to come in and discipline the nation of Israel. In AD 70, the punishment fit the crime. The great temple of Herod was rent stone by stone. The Jewish people were diasporized across the Greco-Roman world. And it wasn't until 1946 that they were drawn back in again. There is now a secular Jewish state. There are some who worship according to the old Mosaic law, Though, of course, with no temple, no ability to offer sacrifices in the way that that law required. There are some Jews who follow Jesus as the Messiah, but not many. This will be the covenant that he will make with them when he takes away their sin. For he has disciplined them, but he has not abandoned them. All Israel has not yet been saved even having been drawn back to their homeland, at least in part, part of their homeland, even while given a, maybe we would call it a geographical salvation, in part. That's not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about issues of the heart. He's talking about a heart transformation deep within the Jewish people. He's talking about salvation. The deliverer will come from, ban uh, from Zion and will banish ungodliness. As regards the gospel, verse 28, they are enemies for your sake. 
Paul knew that. He faced no greater opposition anywhere than he did from the Jews who had rejected Jesus as Messiah. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. God made a promise to Abraham about his kids. He's going to keep that promise. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too now have been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that they may have mercy on all. And then he concludes here at the end of chapter 11, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. He says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. There are really, I think, three ways, and these are worth uh, noting to memory or jotting down somewhere, three ways that we have in the modern world thought about God's relationship to the nation of Israel as we examine it through the lens of the New Testament. The first is this, that Israel has been replaced by the church. That Israel has been replaced by the church. Uh, this is very, very prominent in covenant theology and in amillennialism, right? The church replaces Israel. All of the promises that God made to Israel, even though Israel understood them as literal concretized promises, they're all being fulfilled, at least spiritually, in the church that the church is the new inheritor of all of the promises to the Jews. This is sometimes called replacement theology. Replacement theology, in my best understanding, means this, that there are those who were cut out from the olive tree, but they, in fact, have no opportunity to be grafted in again. That God is functionally and purposefully done with Israel forever. Option number two, that God has a plan for Israel. He had one in the past. He had one in the future. He has one now. And the church is a parenthesis in God's plan. That while he's waiting on the Jews, the church is now just how God is occupying himself. He really wants to be with the Israelites, but because they're in time out, he's going to play with us instead, right? A parenthesis a distraction from the ultimate objective, which is renewing his relationship with Israel. In old school dispensationalism, this is how the church is described, as a parenthesis, right? I gotta tell you that really chafes me in a very particular way because it seems to make very little of the intentionality with which God has pursued the Gentile world. The church isn't an afterthought, right? The church has been a part of the plan for God to reconcile all things unto himself, to enrich the world and to redeem the world. I think a third option is maybe better, and it's this. That God's covenant promises are already being fulfilled in the church age, but are not yet being fulfilled to Israel, though they will be. That there is an already not yet tension in the New Testament that the many of God's covenant promises have already been inaugurated, right? Not all of them. There are promises like the promise for land. Back in Genesis chapter 12, I'll give you land. This is reiterated there at the end of Deuteronomy, very specific parameters for the land. That's not for the church. That's for the nation itself, literally. That's not yet. But that Jesus' reign has been inaugurated, I think is clear from Peter's sermons in Acts chapters 2 and 3, that the promise, the covenant that was made with David, while not being consummated as it will be when the Jews are grafted back in, has been inaugurated. That there is an already not yet sense to the reign of Jesus, that there is an 
already, not yet since the fulfillment of the new covenant, that the new covenant was made to the Jewish people, that it has been applied in the church age, that we are inheritors of the benefit of the new covenant, but it will not fully be consummated until the Jews have been grafted back in, that there is an already not yet tension in the New Testament. God's covenant promises are already being fulfilled in the church age, but will not reach total fruition until Israel has been redeemed. And this is my best understanding of how we read the New Testament. Now, we could spend an awful lot of time there, but I do want to ask one question here in closing, and it's this. So what? Right? Who cares? Uh, nobody in the room is Jewish, right? Sharon's a little Jewish. So other than Sharon, why does anybody in the room care what God does for Israel? It's one nation, very small. They seem to be taking care of themselves. What do we care if the promises that he made to them he doesn't keep? What if they're spiritualized in some nebulous way and applied to the church? Why would we care? We care because the entirety of of the character of God rests in his willingness to fulfill his promises. Now, uh, when Laura and I got married, right, I made a promise to her that for our lives, richer or poorer, sickness and health, I'm hers and she's mine forever. Right? I can't take on, like a sister wife, and say, those no longer apply to you. They were only made figuratively to you, right? Um, I've gotten married, and now, well, really, they apply literally to her, but you, it's bizarre. It's a violation of my character. It proves I was a dirty dog all along, right? We want promises that mean something. Uh, I remember being, I don't know, eight or nine years old, and uh, I lived with mom and pop, but about every other weekend and certain holidays, I'd go spend some time with my dad, right? And I remember going one weekend, he goes, hey, we're going to go to the circus. And uh, I had spent enough time with him that I knew that whatever plans that he had made were possible at best. We're going to go to the circus. It's going to be great. You've never seen anything like it, right? And one of his brothers came over and uh, slid me a $20 bill and said, hey, this is for you. You go to the circus, right? And instead, uh, Dad found that $20 bill. We got in the car, rode down to, because they have these in Ohio, uh, drive through liquor stores, right? <laughs> Imagine the wisdom of that. He bought two bottles of Wild Irish Rose, one red and one white, drank both of them in the car, threw them out the car window into the creek, got home, passed out watching a rerun of Bonanza. <laughs> No circus. A month later, I'm home. And Pop says, uh, we've got tickets. We're going to the circus. And you know what I knew? I knew we were going to the circus. And the next night, I was creeped out by clowns in a way that I had never <laughs> been before. Because <laughs> they got right up on me, and I did not like it. <laughs> <laughs> and we saw the lions and we saw the elephants and we heard the music and the trappies and they have never once broken a promise to me and I've known it and I was able to go to bed at night not having to worry about whether or not they meant what they said and so it is with you that he's made promises like, and lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. That there is, like in Philippians 4, a peace that can be applied to your heart that passes your ability to comprehend it. That he will come again at the end of the age and give you a new body to live with him and feast at his father's table forever and ever and ever. And you can go to bed tonight 
in the confidence that what he says is actually true for you. He is a promise-making God. He is a promise-keeping God. And while so many of the promises of the Bible are, I think, inaugurated, already being fulfilled in this, the age of the church, there are many that have not yet been consummated. And we live in that tension, the already not yet tension. Tension is maybe the wrong word. Tension implies that I'm tense, <laughs> but I'm not, because I have an unswerving confidence in a God who always keeps his promises. Father, I pray for the old and the young, the sick and the healthy, the faithful and those of little faith, all who are in this room. I pray that we would remember with a great and unwavering confidence that you are keeping and intend to keep every one of your promises, that you not only have the power, but you also have the providential plan and the unerring will to see it through to the very end. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite you to stand and sing our praise to this promise-keeping God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. your weekend be safe right fire up the grills keep the fireworks to a minimum enjoy the cool weather and remember the character of god which secures all of his promises amen